I am so happy to be here today, uh, sitting in the seat that's made warm by Maria, my good friend, Maria Iliff Wood, author, coach, and now publisher, owner of a press. Mm -hmm. We've been, a, we've been on really good terms for four years, uh, and I'm so happy to be here today to do this interview with you. Thank you, me too. So I thought maybe we would start with what was it like for you starting to think about becoming a publisher? Well, it was funny because I didn't plan on becoming a publisher. <laughs> um, it's, it kind of started with, first of all, people asking me for help with editing their book. And I remember the first time I was asked, I was like, are you, are you sure? I, I, you know, I'm not an editor. I'm not. I don't know anything about editing books or anything. And this person said to me, now that I really would appreciate and value your feedback. And um, I thought, right, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. And, um, and, and I found that I really enjoyed that. So that, that was probably 18 months ago, maybe, when that first happened. And then a couple of other things, a couple of other people Kind of got involved and you know contacted me and said would you give me a hand and then the daily yarns happened which was an, a book that i published through the, um, the pandemic and i didn't plan to publish that either that i started writing it when the pandemic started but not knowing i was writing a book i was publishing a daily post on social media basically kind of talking about what was going on for me with the pandemic, you know, the emotional roller coaster that I was going through. Um, it, it kind of became something as opposed to me knowing what it was going to be. And then I, I, I got to a point where I realized that this was a book. And so I decided to self publish that. And then in fact, it was a year ago this week that I did a live stream about the roller coaster ride of publishing the, doing the self publishing. Um, because like it was there was so much to it and I made so many mistakes and like and there was so much to learn about it and then when after I put that out people started asking me about helping with you know that pub, first of all self-publishing their books and then somewhere in the mix it was Jules I blame it on Jules Jules <laughs> said um she said in the middle of a writing class, oh yeah, Maria's gonna Maria's gonna start a publishing press. So this is Joel Swales, our Swales. writing coach. Yeah. So and I was like, well, where the hell did that come from? Because that wasn't on my agenda, like just wasn't there at all. But it was funny because although I was really surprised to hear it, there was also a part of me that went, Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Like, and then it was like, really, really? And then I had all of this thinking going on about, you know, why would I become a publishing press? I don't know anything about publishing apart from the experience of publishing one book through a traditional publisher and publishing another book as a self-publisher. That's that was, a lot. Yeah, but that's, that's my entire experience of, of publishing. And then we did the summer class and Jacqueline Hollows, who's one of the other authors, mooted the idea of the book. And it was like, ah, maybe this could be the first book that I publish under my company, under you know, my publishing press that I hadn't even registered at that point. So um, what was the question? <laughs> how did you how did you decide to become a press owner? I think <laughs> something like that, wasn't it? So yeah, so I didn't. I didn't actually decide, you know, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was kind of a, a knowing that that was what was going to do and getting pulled in that direction. It's like really felt like life had pulled me in that direction. And then when a different story came along, that was the first opportunity to to actually do it. So I've done in the meantime, I've done so much research, like there's so much 
information online about publishing if you want to, you know, if you decide that you want to do that. Um, I signed up for all sorts of different webinars and courses and um, uh, newsletters and all of that kind of stuff. So I've just been oh, taking on board, taking on board um, so much information and then put it up, putting it all into practice and I was going to say malpractice because I made quite a few mistakes still with a different story. But um, yeah, but, but learning so much doing that as well. You're so modest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like for you publishing a different story from the two seats, the, the writer and the publisher? So from the writing perspective, it was really, it, A, it was really exciting, uh, but also there was the aspect of, you know, five other authors involved in this, all of whom are fabulous writers. Like, so you and Jamie and Usha and Renu and Jacqueline, just fabulous writers. And so there's always an element of, you know, who am I to be putting myself in a book alongside all of this fabulous writing? But there's also a part of me that is, you know, not, it, that doesn't bother me. That's not a, you know, I know my writing's good or I know the writing in here is good. It's been edited. It's had some, some work done on it. But it, you know, I never feel like my writing comes up to the standard of, of other people's writing. And I'm always blown away when people feedback to me about how good the writing is but so there's a part of me that kind of knows that the writing's good and then there's that part of it I think we all have it the part of us that goes you know you shouldn't be saying that you know it's not it's not that's you know don't be a big head that kind of thing so it's like that you know that that kind of those two voices are kind of battling a bit in in your mind when you've got stuff like this going on but and I was really excited about it though and really enjoyed that but I, I suppose for me, the biggest part of the of publishing this book was not about the writing and the editing. It was about pulling it all together. And that for me, it was just I really, really loved the whole experience. The experience of working with a group of lovely people, really, really nice um, group of people. At first, it didn't feel like it was going to get any momentum. So then trying to help. Um, kind of bring people on so that we started to get the momentum and then bringing getting all of the the formatting done and the editing done and re realizing you know there was times when I realized that we'd done the formatting too soon <laughs> and that all the editing throws out the formatting so you do the editing and then it throws out the formatting and then you do the formatting and you see it all as it is and that highlights more editing and so you go back to edit you know so there's all lots and lots of um, to in and fro in or there was lots of to in and fro in and then um, you know learning about the whole process of getting the covers designed and and the correct formats for those things and uploading them into the, the system and learning about the marketing and all of that kind of thing um, which to be fair Jacqueline Hollows did quite a lot of the marketing side we talked a lot but but there was it was a it was a steep learning curve but i absolutely loved it so and as a writer how was the experience for you well first of all i love the writing like first and foremost it's like writing the pieces for class not knowing that where they were going to end up because we didn't plan it. We, we only decided at the end of the um, classes that we would produce the book. So all the work had been written already. So from writing, writing the pieces, what I, what I find really fascinating is how when we're doing the exercises, these, these amazing um, stories come out, um, some of which were true and some of which are not true. Um, so like the crucifixion is, you know, unless we 
believe in past lives, which I'm not 100% sure about. I have no clue really whether I had a past life and in one of those past lives, I was actually a, a witness to the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, so it fascinated me how I could write a piece about that, which felt so real. So from that point of view, I, I absolutely love that. And then I really love the craft of editing, you know, really taking the piece. And, and one of the things I talk about when I talk about editing is that it's almost like in the initial draft, we've got a, a piece of beautiful marble and it's really beautiful as it as it stands. And then the editing is like chipping away at the David in the marble. So I really love that aspect of it as well. Mm. How, how was it like for you to have your personal literary creative writing flourish into book form? It, it's interesting with this one. It's a bit, I hadn't really thought about this before, but like when I published Coaching Presence, I had a lot of fear about it. You know, I had a lot of thinking about, you know, who am I to be writing about coaching? Who am I to be writing about presence? There's so many other great coaches out there, you know, and lots of fear about whether it would get, you know, whether, whether somebody would come and try and knock me off my pedestal. You know, it's like I put myself on a pedestal. I hadn't, but, you know, that like you put yourself in the line of fire and then just wait for the barrage of, of artillery to come your way. And, and there was no artillery, like you came along. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <a fan. laughs> um, so it, the, fir the first book that I put that out there, I was really, really nervous about. With the Daily Yarns, I'd already started, like that was already all out in the public domain. Um, so I'd already seen the, the responses that people had had through the social media posts to the, to the pieces. So with the Daily Yarns, I already knew that um, people would respond well to what I was sharing, even though it was much more personal than it was in, in Coaching Presence. Um, and so when it was published, it was, it wasn't about publishing my work. It was more to do with the satisfaction of having got this, this book, oh, this one, you know, out into the, out into the world that I had put it out into the world. I'd written it. So it was, it was funny how the, there wasn't so much fear attached to, to putting this one out and and even less fear with putting this one out um, because I don't know why because but it's just I know that it's it looks beautiful it's got an amazing cover um, the way that I managed to learn about formatting, it's formatted beautifully, and the work, the content of it is really high quality. And there was, it, it was so much of a piece of something to be proud of putting out there. I was so pleased to, to get it out into the world. So I've never given birth to a baby personally, but what's just occurred to me was like, I think the amount of love that you feel for the baby when it's first born makes everything else disappear, I guess. And I think that's what I experienced a bit with this, mm -hmm. with getting it out into the world and loving it, loving it as much as I did. Um, yeah, none of this, there was no fear attached to it. So you wiped out the fear with the love. I think that probably a lot of writers and would-be authors would really understand what you're talking about when you talk about the fear. Mm. And I was wondering if you would be interested in trying to be a little bit more specific about how you were able to overcome your fears. Yeah, 
You see, I wouldn't say anything that there was anything that I did to overcome the fear. I talked about this a little bit when I did a, an interview with Jules recently. One thing that I realized in that is that I've always been quite defiant. And one of the things I realized in that interview was that I'm also defiant with the stuff in my head that tells me I shouldn't be doing stuff. Like, you know, people can tell me you shouldn't be doing this, but like there's a voice within me that goes, yeah, you should, and can kind of ignore ignore all that um but I think what was interesting was what you said about it wasn't coming from fear it was coming from love and I think it's Marianne Williamson who says we either come from love or we come from fear and so I think it's the because I was so in love with the book and so in love with the writing and seeing how beautiful it was love overrides fear that's the only thing that I can really say to kind of describe that I think mm. Mm. Uh, you coach people in writing now writing their own books how do you help them with that so it's different ways with different people mm. um so for some people, it's just helping them to craft the book a bit more. Um, you know, take their writing and see what I can see in the writing in terms of editing it. I think sometimes people think editing is about correcting and grammar and punctuation. There's an element of that as well. But for me, it's more about um, enriching the book, enriching what's been written, finding more beautiful ways of, of saying what people want to say, things that are gonna make it more compelling for the reader. So that's, that's a pretty easy, easy thing to explain. The other way is if somebody's got a, a, a body of work, they don't always know how to, to um, structure it and put it all together. So I can help by just having a, um, an overview of it all and, and seeing just seeing what I see about how it all fits together and giving that feedback. But then there's the people who, so they're the people who have already done quite a lot of written work already, but there's other people who have uh, either can't get started or get stuck. And so I, I basically, in terms of one-to-one, -one, it's like, just, just talk to them. It's like, one of the things that I realized, like, cause a big question for me was why am I doing a publishing company? It's not my, experience it's not my background but one of the things that I realized is that it's all of my background that makes me good at what I'm doing in terms of helping people because it's not just about helping people to get the writing right it's like all the other stuff that they've got going on um all the stuff that you know all of those everybody's got their voices that says I can't do this I'm not good enough all of that kind of thing and, and people don't often realize why they're stuck or how they're stuck or whether they're stuck like because for some people like they're not actually stuck it's just part of the process but because they're not writing they think it's not not going anywhere it's not doing anything so I, I do some programs what's really fascinating to me is in the programs I invite people to do written exercises, which are designed to help them get unstuck or help them to understand why they want to write the book or help them to get into, a pro, into the practice of writing. It, all, it, all, it operates at, at different levels. And I think that's what I bring to these programs is because of my background in coaching, I can, I can help people and come up with activities and things to do that, that operates at different levels of their consciousness so practical parts of publishing the book but also getting underneath and beyond the these these voices and these barriers that people have got in their minds about you know who am I to publish a book that, that, that kind of thing so I had the opportunity of being edited by quite a few different people some people come in with their heavy boots <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really feel invaded and I had the opportunity to be edited by you um, at your kind offer 
And I definitely felt that mixture of sensitivity to the word and also sensitivity to what I was maybe trying to say. Um, and there was an element of coaching in there. Mm -hmm. I could definitely feel it that you were opening up, asking questions that came from your background, you know, your very considerable background in executive coaching, et cetera. Um, but, but here it was spotlighting, highlighting my text. <laughs> And that felt like I was rising up on a magic carpet when we did that. And it was um, delicate and um, very uh, sensitive. So, you know, you would say something like, uh, would you like to think about how you would say that differently? <laughs> Rather than just <laughs> redlining it and sticking something else in. Yeah. I really appreciated those qualities that you have. No, oh, thank you. I, I'm really, I'm really pleased to hear that. Thank you. I really appreciate hearing that, um, because it is one thing that I am. I try to be really sensitive to because, and I tell you what, <laughs> yeah, it's purely selfish. Um, it's because when I first put my work out to be edited, like when it comes back even before I've seen the feedback, I'm in a tailspin. Like I've had this experience a number of times. I'm less prone to it now because I, I, I understand my process on this. But the first time, you know, I remember the first time I sent um, my coaching presence um, book out, it, it, just in chapters, I always do it in, in small segments first. Um, oh my God, getting the feedback was horrendous. Like it was like, oh my God, I was feel like I'm being personally attacked. And now that it was absolutely nothing to do with the way that the person was giving me the feedback. So because for that book, the two main people who gave me the critical feedback was my husband and my um, uh, coaching lecturer from who was my when I did my uh, coaching qualifications she was my lecturer she was my critical friend in in writing this book and both of them were absolutely giving me the feedback with love but oh my god I mean my husband Ash we had to sit down he had to say to me like you know first of all do you really want me to give you this feedback because it's not a very pleasant experience yes. <laughs> um, for him not for me it wasn't for me either but um but I also knew that like once I'd got over the uh, you know, they, I, I, I put the barriers around me because it was feeling like I was like, I felt like the editing feedback was a personal attack and it, it would take me a while to then settle in to see it for what it was and see that actually it was really helpful. And it's why I put myself through it and my husband through it um, to, to do it because I knew that the book would be so much better as a result of it. And the same happened with the caged mind. It's very different. So Jules was giving me the, the feedback. And I remember the very first email that she sent back and I knew it had got the, the feedback and I was just ready to ditch the whole book straight away. So I think what I'm mindful of is my own personal reactions to, mm. to feedback. So I, I try to be really um, gentle with it, but I still want to... Um, give the feedback and but I, but I also know that I really want the people to it, it isn't about my feedback and about them implementing the changes that I've suggested it's about them finding and keeping their own voice in it and me saying like these are the parts these are the places where your voice could be stronger and so that's what I'm saying and I only even just it's only as I said that I realized what I was what it was about like I knew it was about a new part of it is like I want people to to keep their own voice so not just accept my suggestions as at face value but to really say okay how would how would I say this differently and it still be my voice so I, I so I I want to be I want to be I don't think there's a need for red pen critical highly critical Thing. I think people do enough of that for themselves like we've got enough of that going on so 
Um, so th I really appreciate you saying that. Mm, yeah. With all this lovely stuff happening, I'm wondering if your voice, you're thinking about putting your voice into the future or what, what plans you might have next? So I kind of, it's funny about planning because so much has happened without a plan. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, kind of, I, I do kind of trust in, in that, but I'm, I have gone back to working on A Cage Mind. So A Cage Mind was the book that I wrote. It, it, it's probably getting on for two years ago now since I thought I'd finished writing it. I thought that was the book that I was going to publish last year, but Daily Ones had a different idea and a different story had a different idea to that. Um, but what I've done now is I've, I've gone back to it and now I'm editing it again. So bear in mind that book, I wrote it, I wrote the first draft, I edited it myself. It went to Jules, she gave me loads of really great feedback. It was edited again. So in my mind, I thought it was all done and dusted, but now I'm reading it again and realizing it can be so much stronger. I've learned like 18 months of learning in method writing, you learn so much more, don't you? So um, reading that now, I'm now uh, working on that again. I'm giving it two or three hours a week is my idea. I'm really kind of managing to do that, um, giving it a really, it's quite a ruthless edit again now. And um, and I'm I'm kind of thinking that that might be the next book published, but I don't know because <laughs> I have got um, I've got one other person who um, I'm going to be helping definitely publishing their book, and I've got a couple of other people that I'm helping with um, editing their books, and so who knows they might get published before this one does, but and and have. You know, I know like you, uh, we have other ideas for other books. People keep asking me about a follow on to coaching presence, which I know is going to be it's going to be there somewhere because what I've learned about coaching presence since I first wrote that book is um, such a lot. So I think there's a follow up to that. I'd like to do a book around um, uh, leadership. Ash and I want to write a book together on that. We've made some um start on that as well so who knows what's going to come out next really <laughs> there's lots going on we've always got lots going on yeah yeah talking about lots going on i'm just wondering if the people who are present have questions that they would like to add in and if so if they'd like to turn on their camera and feel free Pretty quiet lot. Yeah. Oh, here we go, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. This is so nice to see you two. I look awful. <laughs> no, you don't. Do you, have you got a question, Jamie? I do, actually. I wanted to, because I, too, listen to your Jules interview, when you had that realization about turning stubbornness on its head. So I guess I want to ask, what would, because you have that kind of natural part of you, it's kind of who you are, what advice would you give aspiring writers who don't have such a strong hand to kill their gremlins. <laughs> I think that writing is, obviously it's an art. And I think that every writer goes into the, oh my gosh, why am I bothering? Oh my gosh, this is so stupid. Oh my gosh, my voice doesn't matter. As a coach and knowing that you have really good internal ability to squash that, what is something you would say to someone like that? Like me, <laughs> what would you tell me? This right. is completely self-serving. 
<laughs> you've, you've got a stubborn streak in you anyway as well. I think I'm pretty sure of that. Um, so in, if I think of myself as a coach, what I'm always doing is pointing people back to who they really are, to the wisdom that they have within themselves that is unfettered and uncontaminated by all of this thinking that we have going on in our minds. And, and once people realize that so much of the stuff that goes on in our heads is not real, most of it is, is not trustable, like it, it's, not, it's not useful information, it's not helpful, and it's not real, the chances of whatever our heads, whatever we make up in our heads, the chances of it happening are pretty remote. Um, so, so the stuff that goes on in our heads is not such a big deal. And it's, it comes and goes. Like we don't have that thinking all of the time. Like sometimes when we're writing, we're not having any other thinking other than what's coming out on the page. It's not until later we start thinking, oh, my God, this is crap or, you know, who am I to be doing this? And so the more that people see that that there's a part of them that is always OK, no matter what what thinking they've got going on in their heads, it doesn't matter what thinking is going on because they're just going to go and do it anyway, because like we were talking earlier, like the publishing company, I felt like life pulled me towards this publishing company another way of me seeing that is like my inner guide was telling me where to go and 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 what to do you know what steps to take and I trust that more than I trust the noise in my head and and everybody has it everybody has inner wisdom inner guide true self that is always okay not broken not contaminated by this stuff and the, if they only realize that, then it doesn't matter what goes on in the head, they'll do it anyway. Does it, for me, it doesn't actually take stubbornness or strength. It just takes me following that knowing that is inside of me rather than paying attention to the negativity. Well, it's funny, right? Because it's almost like, you're a split personality. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. Like if I really took a step back and said, what are the themes of my life? They would be more positive ones. When I look at my life as a whole and the kind of recurring themes, mm. but then you have to be able to kind of ground yourself to that and ignore the other bits of you that want to infiltrate it. I love what you just said there, Jamie, because if people paid more attention to the times when everything was OK and the positive things in their life, they would have less of the negativity going on. Because their focus of attention would be on the positive, not on the negative. And that's not I'm not saying do positive thinking. I'm just saying if you notice the times when actually you feel OK, that actually much happening more often than the times when you're not but we get conditioned into focusing our attention on all the negativity and thinking we have to change it when actually all the negative stuff that goes on in our head will change at some point whether we do anything about it or not i'm taking notes <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you jamie Glenna put her video on as well. I didn't know if she wanted to ask a question. Well, hi there. Well, first of all, I say thank you. This is a great interview, I think, from both your parts and congratulations on that. And um, I think that the reason there are not so many Montrealers is because we only learned of it this morning. And uh, Marie, I think you mentioned this afternoon for the interview, which is where you are. But for us, it's morning. And that <laughs> confused a few people too, but I, I hope they'll um, benefit from the recording. And uh, I would say uh, uh, from what you've said and what Jamie said is that we're really talking about people taking the jump and that you're there to catch them. 
Uh, you know, if they're ready to take the jump in a way, the risk, be it for their ego or what have you, that you're there to offer the support that and what we seem to be saying that everyone has these feelings that all emotions and all uh, uh, um, uh, feelings uh, don't last always, you know, they, they fade, right? Uh, even the most, uh, even fear, anxiety, all of that. And um, just uh, you're kind of saying, just do it. You know, if you have the inkling, just do it, which is what you did for and, and look at the success you've uh, realized. And, and that's great. So uh, I don't really have a further question or just observing that the same themes seem to be coming up. And uh, given that, we should accept them. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, yeah. And, and I love that metaphor about jumping. I, I think the way that I would see it, like if I'm helping people, I think the way that I would see it is, is that I'm, I think I've got their hand while they're jumping. That's I right. I'm catch, I don't think I'll catch them because they don't need catching. They just okay. know that they're able to do the jump. And sometimes all you need to be able to do the jump is knowing that somebody's got your back. You know, that's right they're not going to let you they're not going to let you fall into the ravine or whatever they're, they're going to make sure that you get across there but you're going to get across there yourself of course yes it's a tapping the resources available to you which is yeah. a, a smart thing to do mm -hmm. thank you thank you glenna thank you so much anybody else thank you glenna Okay, Maria, is there anything else you'd like to add? I think that one of, one of the things that I don't have a problem with is, is actually sitting down and writing. And I think if people had any clue about how much I actually write compared to how much actually gets published, I think they'd be they'd be astonished um, because I would say, oh, I don't know if I think about, you know, I've written pretty much every day for 12 years. I started it when I did my first uh, postgraduate coaching qualification. So that was in 2009. So that's how long I've been writing pretty much every day. And so he'd say 97% probably of what I write on a daily basis doesn't go anywhere. And so I think that's the thing for people. If they, if they want to write, they think they want, they want to write a book. They think that everything that they write needs to be, needs something doing with it. But actually it's just practicing. You know, we do it for class. We just practice writing for class and then when we do come to write something sometimes something comes out of that and then you go oh yeah I think I'll publish that but vast, vast majority of what I write doesn't go anywhere but I just I just love to sit down and, and write so I'm never I'm never thinking when I'm writing I'm I'm never no not never I'm hardly ever thinking that this is going to go anywhere or do anything and that gives me the freedom to write whatever and then occasionally I have to write for a purpose. Um, so say I've been asked to write an article for a particular blog. Um, then I have to write about a certain subject, but it's still the same kind of thing. I don't, I don't think in advance about what I'm going to write. And, you know, other people do do that, but I don't. Um, and it just gives me a freedom. It gives me the freedom to write anything and then something else happens. So um, I think that's that's the thing that I would one of the things that I would say is like write for the enjoyment of it. Well, there's so many more questions in my head, but I see that we're over time. <laughs> so I guess we better wrap it up here. I just want to thank you so very much indeed for having been so generous uh, with everything that you've said uh, today. Uh, it's surely very illuminating for everyone to have a sense that you're there should they need a little bit of help and to see your path. So thank you. No, thank you, Anne. It's been really lovely. I really appreciated it. Take care.